This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Kenya promises to seek diplomatic solution after Somalia severs ties. Boko Haram claims responsibility for abduction of school children in Nigeria's Katsina state. And in Africa Live Business, Nigeria targets to exit recession by the first quarter of 2021. Hello and thank you for joining us on Africa Live. I am Penina Karibe. We begin this hour in Nigeria. Insurgent group Boko Haram has claimed responsibility for the recent abduction of more than 300 schoolboys from a secondary school in the northwestern Katsina state. The country has been dealing with an insurgency that has lasted more than 10 years, claimed the lives of more than 20,000 people and displaced 3 million more. Philly Haza has the details from Abuja. They may be going about their normal activities, but in the minds of many here in Abuja is the attack which took place 500 kilometers away in Katsina State. Gunmen attacked an old boys government science secondary school there last week, and since then, more than 300 of the students are missing. I feel so worried about the incident, because it's happening not too far from us here. I think insecurity is getting too bad in this country, and... To me, in my own opinion, I don't think the government is doing enough to protect the lives and property of citizens. It's so sad and scary because a similar incident occurred, which is the, the Chibo girls incident, and the government has failed to bring many of these girls back. The gunmen, who claimed to be Boko Haram members, stormed the school with motorbikes and abducted hundreds of the students, easily overpowering security personnel at the facility. This latest attack happened just weeks after more than 40 rice farmers were killed by the same terrorist group in the northeast. And experts say the country's security situation may be worsening. This latest incident is simply one of uh, the high points of the cross-border banditry activities in the northwest. And uh, this might go down in recent history as the largest single abduction of the highest number of people in one single incident, and uh, it's very unfortunate it's happening at this time. President Muhammad Buhari has ordered the military to do its best to find and rescue the boys, and the military say they have cordoned off the area where they believe the abductors are keeping the students. But experts want the government to complement the efforts of the already stretched security personnel tackling different fronts of insecurity across the country. But what's one thing is preventing a recurrence, and I think. Beyond reforming our security agencies and repositioning them to be able to take on the responsibility of securing lives and properties, I think it is high time the government considers a, a civil armament program for Nigerians living on the front lines of theater of war, of the, of the war on terror in the Northeast, and on banditry. In the northwest. Six years ago, more than 200 schoolgirls were kidnapped in Chibok, Bernu State, by the same Boko Haram insurgents. Many of the girls are still missing, despite the government's efforts to find them. It's difficult to explain the kind of grief the parents of these missing schoolboys are feeling at the moment. The hope is that all the boys are found and rescued. And if that happens, experts say it could go a long way in renewing Nigerians' hope and confidence in government's efforts in tackling insecurity. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja. Sudan's Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok has hailed the official removal of Sudan from the U.S. list of state sponsors of terrorism. The designation of Sudan as a state sponsor of terrorism dates back to 1993. The delisting comes after the transitional government in Khartoum paid 335 million U.S. dollars to American victims of terrorist attacks and has shown willingness to normalize ties with Israel. As Sarah Kim looks at the implications of this decision. It's a major achievement for the transitional government. It's a new era. These are the words of Sudanese Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdouk after the removal of the country from the list of states that sponsor terrorism. 
It's a country that was under sanctions for nearly three decades, so the negative implications have been huge economically and politically. The economic downturn has prevented the state from providing basic services such as health and education. Also, the dire living conditions led to political crisis and armed conflicts like in Darfur and South Kordofan. The violence there was linked to the lack of development in the area. Sudan was on the list due to its alleged close ties with Al-Qaeda leaders, as well as Iran and Hamas. It's also accused of terrorist attacks on U.S. facilities in Africa and Yemen. Its removal from that U.S. list opens the door to increased development. The situation was psychologically degrading and hurtful, and therefore the delisting has a positive impact on Sudan, its status politically and its people. Economically, Sudan will be able to reintegrate into the global economy and deal with international financial institutions. It will be able to negotiate reducing its $60 billion debt and will also be able to receive foreign loans. According to experts, the next step for Sudan's leadership is to maintain internal peace and stability. Another priority is to seek debt relief and apply for external loans in order to rebuild the shattered country. Yasser Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. Southern African leaders will hold a special summit early next year to discuss the growing state of insecurity in the region. This came as the UN announced that as many as 400,000 people have fled the attacks in northern Mozambique. Angela Kupler has more on this story. SADC leaders got together in Maputo on Monday to discuss the worsening military situation in the northern part of the country. This barely two weeks since the SADC Troika leaders met to discuss the same situation. Analysts say that this points to a volatile situation in the area. Internally displaced people are flooding into aid agency sites with only the clothes on their backs. Reports are also coming in of increased insurgency activity and aid agencies say a solution must be found or it could spill over into neighbouring countries. Authorities and aid agencies are also increasingly concerned as the rainy season is fast approaching. People in the northern area still haven't recovered from two cyclones that struck in 2019 killing hundreds of people and leaving hundreds of thousands destitute. The news that a special summit has been called have been welcomed, Alan say, but an action plan is needed. For now, residents face an uncertain future. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, Kenya says it will not retaliate to Somalia's move to expel its diplomats from Mogadishu uh, from, from Mogadishu, but will instead seek diplomatic solutions to the current spot with Mogadishu. The Kenyan government spokesman says Kenya will set up a mediation team to look into the issues raised by Somalia in order to strike a diplomatic solution between the two neighboring countries. Somalia has cut diplomatic ties with Kenya, accusing Nairobi of violating its sovereignty, territorial integrity and interfering with the upcoming elections. The move to server ties came days after Mogadishu expelled Kenya envoy in the country. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilu filed the following report from the Somali capital. On Tuesday, the federal government of Somalia severed diplomatic ties with Kenya. Mogadishu is accusing Nairobi of violating its sovereignty and interfering in its internal affairs. The federal government of Somalia hereby cuts all diplomatic ties with Kenya. The government has recalled its diplomats stationed in Kenya back home and gives all Kenyan diplomats stationed in Mogadishu a seven-day ultimatum to leave the country. Last month, Somalia expelled Kenya's top diplomat in the country and recalled its ambassador from Nairobi, accusing Kenya of interfering in the upcoming general elections scheduled for next year. The fallout also saw Mogadishu end a visa program for Kenyan nationals. Under the new directive by the Department of Immigration and Citizenship, all Kenyan passport holders traveling to Somalia will need to obtain visas before arriving in the country. At the center of the diplomatic standoff are Jubaland and Somaliland, located in the north and south of the country. On Monday, the Kenyan president hosted the leader of the breakaway region of Somaliland at State House Nairobi, a move that has angered Mogadishu. Elsewhere, the jubilant president is threatening to pull out of the September election deal unless federal forces are pulled out from Gedo, which lies along the border with Somalia and Kenya. Mogadishu insists that Nairobi is pressuring the jubilant president, a claim denied by both parties. 
The federal government believes that Jubaland is getting a lot of support from uh, security and political support from Kenya. This is one trigger of this uh, decision. The second trigger is the uh, recently uh, uh, the visit of uh, Somalian president to Kenya, which is currently in Kenya for three days uh, visit. Uh, this was, uh, the federal government is, see this as uh, preaching the uh, sovereignty of Somalia. Tension in relations between the two East African neighbors escalated in 2019 after Nairobi accused Mogadishu of auctioning oil and gas blocks along the disputed area in the Indian Ocean. The International Court of Justice is expected to issue a verdict on the maritime case in March next year. The area in contention is believed to contain rich oil and gas deposits. And on the security front, Kenya contributes close to 4,000 troops to the African Union troops based in Somalia, AMISOM. There are concerns that this latest diplomatic standoff will affect the security operations. Going forward, I think Somalia and Kenya need to improve their relationship. They're, they have a lot of things that they can collaborate and uh, uh, cutting diplomatic ties will not uh, go well with uh, citizens of the both countries. I think the IGAT regional body and the African Union need to uh, convene meetings and discuss uh, how the, the relationship of these two countries can be improved. On Sunday, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, will host an emergency summit in Djibouti to discuss the latest diplomatic standoff between the two member states. Experts now say that an amicable solution must be reached in order to protect relations between the governments and citizens of both countries. Abdul Aziz Bilon, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. Let's discuss this further with security expert, retired Brigadier General Ahmed Mohammed, joining us live via Zoom from Nairobi. General Mohammed, for decades, bilateral relations between Kenya and Somalia have been warm and cordial. What changed in the past couple of years? Thank you, Penina, for having me. As you said, uh, the relations have been good over the years, but in the last four to five years, we see a series of events that have led to this uh, issues now. The first one is the maritime dispute between Kenya and Somalia, uh, which uh, we are now have the case in the ICJ and still unresolved. Then second is the relationship between Kenya and Ahmed Mohammed Aslam, that's Madobe, in Jubaland, which is of concern to the government of, um, of Somalia. And uh, of course, um, third is just what, what happened today, the meeting of the president of Somaliland the president of, uh, of Kenya, which uh, took place in Nairobi today. Now, finally, it is strongly believed that um, the main issue at this time is the issue of elections and that the president of Somalia is actually uh, looking for destruction from the electoral uh, challenges he's facing back in the country. Over to you, Right. So now we are seeing Somalia severing ties with Kenya. What are the implications of such a move? Well, we'll see for some time now tensions and standoff between the two countries. Uh, of course, Kenya has been very quiet and diplomatic. Uh, Somalia may continue to pursue uh, these issues. The only worry is that uh, Ashabar will take advantage of the tensions and uh, be able to be active during this uh, period of tension. And having talked about the Al-Shabaab threat, General, what will happen to military cooperation between Somalia and Kenya, which has sent troops to Somalia under the African Union mission? Well, as you know, Penina, Kenya has sent has over 3,600 troops in Somalia uh, since uh, a crossing over to secure uh, Akismayu. Now, the troops came initially as Kenya's own contribution, but over time, they became part of the African Union force. And as now, it's not really a bilateral, it's an African Union force. And indeed, for any action to take place on the troops, it is the AU that will need to take action. Now, remember also that uh, Kenya is covering the area of um, Jubaland and Kismayu, which are very, very sensitive. It's not the time really to think about uh, removing those troops, Marina. All right, General, thank you very much for that. General, uh, retired Brigadier General Ahmed Mohammed speaking to us live via Zoom here in Nairobi. Now, Turkey is condemning new U.S. sanctions of its purchase of Iranian S-400 air defense system. 
Washington's measures target Turkey's top weapons procurement body, saying the missile system could endanger U.S. military technology and personnel. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan made clear he's angered by the sanctions and says he may retaliate. Mikhail Bardavid has more from Istanbul. From Erdogan's statement, he stresses disappointment from an ally. So this is much uh, different from his usual statements where he's much stronger, much harsher in his words. So this could signal that Turkey is actually eager to ease tension rather than increase it. But for Erdogan, of course, it's important to appear strong as well. So doing nothing uh, could be unlikely at this moment. We could expect that Ankara would impose sanctions that would be very similar to those imposed by the United States. This is usually the kind of strategy that Turkey follows. Uh, we can see this from earlier experiences from the United States and from the EU as well. But also, this is a critical time for Turkey-U.S. ties, as, of course, there's going to be the transition between U.S. President Donald Trump and Biden. 16 minutes into the hour, you're watching Africa Live. Let's take a short break coming up. South Africa goes into the festive season with tighter restrictions as second wave of COVID-19 bites. And grandmothers in Zimbabwe stepping up to mend relations and keep the peace amid rising domestic violence. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. Somalia and China are celebrating a great milestone in relations between the two countries. CGTN's Abdulaziz Bilu attended the ceremony to mark the 60th anniversary since Somalia and China established diplomatic ties and filed this report from Mogadishu. In December 1960, barely five months after Somalia gained independence, diplomatic ties between the two nations were established, making Somalia the first East African nation to establish diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China. Diplomats, foreign heads of missions and senior officials from the Somali government attended the 60th anniversary celebrations of ties between Somalia and China in the capital Mogadishu. Somali officials praised Beijing for its increased assistance to the African continent, especially during this global coronavirus pandemic. Uh, they say a true friend is one who is there during your worst times and hardships. China has been a true friend to Somalia and was quick to assist Somalia during the civil war, providing millions in aid. Uh, we hold our friendship with China in high regard and remain thankful for the relentless, relentless support uh, you have for our nation. Uh, we are especially thankful for China's swift response uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, sending Somalia three blades full of necessary PPE equipment to fight and contain uh, the coronavirus disease. Uh -huh. Ho -ho! The Chinese top diplomat in the country, Ambassador Xinjiang, hailed the decades-long ties between the two countries, while vowing to strengthen diplomatic ties, cultural exchanges, and relations between the two governments and people of both countries. Looking back on the history, friendship between China and the Somali has a long, long history. China and the Somali has always been good friends, good partners, good brothers, help each other and support each other. Looking forward to future, a friendship between our two countries will last forever. Somali will become better and better. Somali will shine in the whole of Africa. In their congratulatory messages, Chinese and Somali leaders said that in the past 60 years, 
Somalia and China have witnessed steady developments of their long-term friendly relations and sound cooperation in many fields. In 2018, Chinese President Xi Jinping and his Somali counterpart Mohamed Abdullah Farmajo met in Beijing at the Forum on China-African Cooperation. Cooperation between the governments of Somalia and China have mainly remained in the terms of cultural and developmental cooperation. Um, I believe that there is a huge opportunity for Somalia and for China to cooperate further, especially under the Belt and Road Initiative. The commemoration of ties comes as the Horn of African nation struggles with a series of climate-related disasters, including a massive locust invasion in parts of the country. China has always been a key player in the humanitarian field, assisting the federal government with relief aid and financial assistance to combat natural disasters. Students also continue to benefit from free Chinese government scholarships as trade between both countries increase despite the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Abdul Aziz Bilo, CGTN, Mogadishu, Somalia. South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has once again imposed tighter national COVID-19 restrictions, including those governing alcohol sales and large gatherings. In a televised national, national address, Ramaphosa told the nation that rising COVID-19 cases are a cause of great concern as the country has now entered a second wave of infections. Sajitian Zulisa Njamela has more. President Cyril Ramaphosa has decried South Africans' failure to comply with COVID-19 measures. He says that has brought upon the second wave of infections. There can no longer be any doubt that South Africa has entered a second wave of coronavirus infections, which we've been talking about. Given the rate at which new cases have grown over the last two weeks, there is every possibility that if we do not act urgently and if we do not act together, the second wave will be even more severe than the first wave. Of particular concern, the president said, are large gatherings which have the potential to become super spreader events. The current restrictions on the size of gatherings do not do enough to prevent crowding in the current situation where new cases are rising rapidly. Therefore, gatherings, including religious gatherings, may not be attended by more than 100 people for indoor events and 250 for outdoor events. Non-essential establishments, including restaurants and bars, will be required to close at 10 p.m. The president also announced that the sale of alcohol and consumption would also be restricted. The sale of alcohol from retail outlets will only be permitted between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. from Monday to Thursday. Registered wineries and wine farms may continue to offer tastings and wine sales to the public for off-site consumption over weekends. This exception is being made due to the vital contribution of these establishments to the tourism sector in several parts of the country. In areas with higher rates of infections, beaches and public parks will be closed for the duration of the festive season. One of the greatest challenges we need to confront are the huge crowds that flock to our beaches and recreational parks on public holidays over the festive season. We have undertaken extensive consultation on this issue so that we can find an approach that reduces the risk of large-scale transmission while limiting the negative impact on businesses in coastal areas of our country. On top of that, the countrywide curfew will be extended, starting from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. These festive season restrictions will be reviewed in early January based on the status of the pandemic countrywide. Yuli Sanjamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa.
Domestic disputes and gender-based violence have increased in Zimbabwe since COVID-19 related restrictions were put in place. Despite these challenges, some people are trying to reverse that trend. Hundreds of grandmothers are helping to mend relations, keep the peace, as well as offer encouragement and advice to people during this stressful period. CGTN's Farim Wakutuya has that story. They have centuries of life experience and wisdom between them and have also been equipped with counseling skills. These grannies are part of the Friendship Bench project and every week they sit and talk to people in this community. People did not know where to get help before we started working here. There used to be a number of suicide in this neighborhood, but now we are helping people to work through their problems and look for other options. Sarah Wakoya has been a counselor since 2014. Her services have been particularly useful this year. The COVID-19 pandemic has affected many people's livelihoods and also taken a toll on their mental and emotional well-being. I've had many clients since COVID-19 infections began. There have been many domestic violence cases because of the economic stress. A notable one was in September when I met a couple fighting on the street. I began counseling the wife and now they are getting on again. The wife now refers anyone she meets who is going through any psychological problems to me. She has also dealt with people in financial distress and through the Friendship Bench project, signed them up to savings clubs and helped them get business training. We have so many women that are now empowered who have been trained in weaving bags and some have their own shops through saving clubs. Yet when they came to us, they felt they had no other options. Wakoya likened counseling to having a multi-sized spanner capable of fastening any type of bolt. By talking to people, she says, she can help them resolve any kind of problem. Some people are initially just quiet. Some cry, and I let them do that so that they can let it all out. After that, it's easier to talk about their problems and to see the options they have. The most important thing is not to judge, but to listen to their story and find ways to encourage them. The Friendship Bench is planning to scale up its services and recruit more grannies to lend a listening ear to people who want to talk about their problems. Farang Wakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. The world is still in the woods as the coronavirus pandemic claims more lives. It is a situation that was unexpected. However, mankind has long been digging and indeed getting into a hole that would be hard to get out of. In today's first episode of Panorama Africa, Lindim Tongana unpacks the grim realities of climate change across the world. dare you? People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. How dare you? It hurts. Global warming, climate change and conservation Words that are more often said than acted upon by governments and leaders of the world. The truth is, climate change has been brought about by the greed that favors few, but affects us all. And not just humans, the entire planet. If wild animals and plants had an enemy, it would probably be us humans. We need only look at the ways in which we've ravaged the earth to understand why. Here's some facts to help put this into perspective. Over the last century, the planet has warmed at a rate of one degree Celsius a year. Hard to notice as we go about our day-to-day -day lives, but over the past five years, temperatures have risen at record levels. The whole situation is linked to three human activities. The burning of fossil fuels, intensive farming, especially for meat and crop production, and deforestation. 
Here in Africa, extreme weather patterns are already wreaking havoc in many nations. In 2019 and much of 2020, parts of East and West Africa were hit by floods, leaving a trail of death and destruction. The region is also recovering from two devastating cyclones, which resulted in deaths and the displacement of thousands. The cyclones also destroyed crop production, leaving aid agencies to respond to multiple humanitarian crises. In Beiro, you go, the scars of Cyclone Edai are visible. However, authorities and aid workers believe that they have the cholera outbreak under control. A desert locust invasion that started in the Horn of Africa has added to the region's woes. Crops that were planted by smallholder farmers have been destroyed by the pests. Meanwhile, weather experts have been predicting a drought on the heels of these floods. It seems when it rains, it pours in Africa. Even sunny spells are no longer normal. They are often searingly hot and accompanied by food and water shortages. This is climate change at play. And it's not just Africa. Asia, the Americas and Europe have all found themselves at the deep end of climate change. Cyclones, heat waves, fires and heavy rains are all becoming increasingly common. According to German infographics firm Statista, countries like China, Bangladesh, Pakistan and India are among the world's most polluted. However, countries like Finland, Norway, Sweden and Estonia are those considered least polluted. Here in Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Ethiopia and Egypt are among those whose pollution levels are most worrying. Although there have been efforts to contain the situation, lack of cooperation is seen as the biggest impediment. Some conservationists see climate conferences as little more than talk shops. All heat, but no fire. The United States pulled out of the 2016 Paris Agreement, which was aimed at fostering a global response to the threat of climate change. Remember, the US is home to only 4.4% of the global population, yet it is one of the world's biggest emitters of greenhouse gases, the main cause of global warming. But with the recent presidential election outcome in the United States, things could change. Joe Biden, who won the polls, has promised to review Trump's decision to pull out of the Paris Agreement. We're here to raise our voices. Uh, we know that climate change has already started and it's killing us. While grandstanding marks this debate, coral reefs are disappearing and glaciers are melting, leading to rising sea levels. Despite Africa contributing the least to the world's greenhouse gas emissions, the continent is feeling the heat. Food production is being compromised as populations continue to expand. Forests are being cleared to create habitats, which feeds into an already complicated situation. This is conflict. For a long time, the Sahel region was a bedrock of symbiotic coexistence between herders and farmers. Farmers would allow their nomadic brothers and sisters to graze their livestock on their land and fertilize it for the next growing season. But years of unfavorable weather patterns led to cycles of poor harvests. With dwindling food production, a conflict ensued. This is what has been exploited by Al-Qaeda and ISIL to create a potent security threat. This has already claimed a regime in Mali and has influenced election outcomes in countries like Nigeria and Guinea-Bissau. We could list more and more climate change related cases and incidents. However, this boils down to individuals and governments. Climate change poses a serious threat to the fundamental rights for all. It affects our access to food, to health, and compromises our quality of life for individuals and communities. It is thus our individual, national, and international responsibility to care for nature, for us and future generations. The late Nobel laureate Professor Wangari Mathai once said, Mother Nature is very generous, but also very unforgiving. The reality is, if you destroy nature, nature could destroy you. If we are not careful enough and responsible, this could be practical in our lifetime. It would appear it has already started happening. You're watching Africa Live. Coming up in business news.
Nigeria targets to exit recession by the first quarter of 2021. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Nigeria is currently in its second economic recession in four years, but authorities believe this will be short-lived. Both the country's finance minister and governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria have projected that the country could exit recession by the first quarter of 2021 and forecast a positive GDP growth in 2021. Here's Deji Badmas with more on that story. Nigeria's second quarter contraction, which caused the economy to slip into recession, was widely expected. But at just minus 3.62 percent, the scale of the contraction was quite surprising. Many had projected a much steeper contraction, but the country's fiscal and monetary authorities say the lower than expected decline is largely a result of the huge funding interventions they made to cushion the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on households and businesses. With sustained implementation of our intervention measures, we do expect that the Nigerian economy could emerge from the recession by the first quarter of 2021. We also expect that growth in 2021 will attain 2.0%. However, downside risks remain, as restoration of full economic activities, particularly in service-related sectors, remain uncertain until a COVID vaccine is produced and made available to millions of people across the world. The Nigerian government rolled out its economic sustainability plan back in June this year to tackle the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. The plan provides for a $5 billion stimulus package targeted at job creation, households and businesses. The central bank has so far been an important driver of the initiative, providing unprecedented funding support to various sectors of the economy. We have seen that this has been quite impactful particularly the targeted credit facility, which is meant for household and SMEs, because what we saw during this period is, is that it has helped to boost consumption spending for our SMEs. And if you know or recall that consumption constitutes over almost 70% of output, you will know that this has been very, very impactful in moderating the impact of the COVID-19 on productivity and output and GDP in our country. The government is still coming up with more initiative and literally putting more money in the hands of the people with the hope of turning things around for the economy. So I think the, the, the steps are in the, the things are in the right direction. But these policies need to be complemented with other policies, just as the city and governor said. We need to complement it with the fiscal policies. We need to address the issue of the structural issues. We need to address the issue at the ports. We also need to address the issue of logistics and all, all, all of that. So there has to be complementary policies on the fiscal side to support what is happening on the monetary side. And just as I said, we need to address the issue of the foreign exchange market. One other good thing for Nigeria is that oil prices are gradually picking up and that could help shore up the country's reserve and keep its currency stable. And with COVID-19 vaccine now being approved for use, some beat of normalcy may begin to return to the global economy. That, of course, would further boost the local economy here and possibly get the country off the recession as quickly as officials are predicting. Dejabad Moss, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. South Africa is still recovering from the initial hard lockdown that saw the entire economy come to a grinding halt. All sectors were affected, including small-scale and subsistence farmers. Now, one large business is working with the country's National Agriculture Department to assist local farmers find their feet. CGTN's Angela Kupla picks up the story. Total SA and the Department of Agriculture have created the $90,000 COVID-19 Agricultural Support Fund. It's targeted at helping 36 female farmers heavily hit by COVID-19. It's a good start, 
but more still needs to be done. The biggest challenge that I have is the irrigation scheme because my people are watering all this garden and this chicken via the watering cans, which is too labour intensive. Many farmers have decided to act rather than wait for government support. That time gave me an opportunity to build on, 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 on the product itself. I managed to like build on, a, a, a grow the soil and even grow the plants so that if after COVID things come open, I'll be ha having a lot of produce to supply. Small-scale and subsistence farmers are entrepreneurial and agile enough to spot an opportunity and act on it much faster than the bigger commercial farmers. I've learned a lot because I grew up in a farm and we used to use all this uh, herbal medication. Hence, I've planted it like this. I would like the government to recognize us for that so that they can see that we as South Africans, we do have this stuff. It's just that nobody is, 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 is looking out for such farmers. Farming is a hardcore business and you need to be focused because you're having to deal with the natural environment and you're having to deal with bureaucracy. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Social media giant Facebook is under fire again, and this time it may be up against the toughest legal battle it's ever faced, twin lawsuits from both the federal and state governments. Mark Niu has the details. Thank you, Ms. Dorsey. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg. Over the past year, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has been repeatedly dragged before the U.S. Congress over numerous issues, including monopolistic behavior and acquiring the photo-sharing app Instagram. And in a later email, you confirmed that one of the purposes of Facebook acquiring Instagram would be to neutralize a competitor. Uh, you wrote those emails that were mentioned in that House report. Is that right? I believe so. And I've always distinguished between two things, though. One is that uh, we, we had some competition with Instagram in the, in the growing space of kind of camera apps and photo sharing apps. Uh, but at the time, I don't think we or anyone else viewed Instagram as a competitor is a kind of large multi-purpose social platform. Three weeks later, 48 U.S. state attorneys general filed a suit claiming that if a company stepped into Facebook's turf, Zuckerberg would go into destroy mode and they'd have to face the wrath of Mark. That same day, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission filed a suit alleging that Facebook squelched competition by acquiring Instagram and instant messaging service WhatsApp, quoting a Zuckerberg email saying, it is better to buy than compete. And they're claiming that Facebook actually acquired these companies in the early 2010s because it wanted to kill off competition, not because it wanted to make services better for its users. But the problem is, is that the FTC is going to have to fight these big hypothetical arguments that consumers would have been better had these acquisitions not happened, which is tough because prices weren't increased. There's no price gouging that happened because all these services are free. In a statement, Facebook's general counsel Jennifer Newstead called the lawsuits revisionist history, saying that their acquisitions of Instagram and WhatsApp were already reviewed by antitrust regulators at the time. Facebook's general counsel also accuses the U.S. Federal Trade Commission and states of standing by while the company invested billions of dollars and millions of hours of time into making WhatsApp and Instagram into what they are today. She says before the purchases, WhatsApp had very little presence in the U.S. and Instagram just 13 employees and no revenue. The other thing that Facebook is going to have to argue is that, uh, that these companies actually uh, are much stronger when they're all together and they can solve some of Facebook's biggest existential problems better when they're one giant company with economies of scale. You can imagine it might be harder for companies like WhatsApp and Instagram to fight election interference or misinformation if they didn't have all of Facebook's resources behind them. Constine says if the lawsuits succeed, it could have a chilling effect on future acquisitions, but a legal victory won't come easy for government attorneys. He says the Federal Trade Commission is shorthanded compared to Facebook, which pours millions of dollars into lobbying and has hundreds of lawyers who can fight lawsuits for years to come. To the goal line. Mark New, CGTN, San Francisco. Researchers estimate that more than 80% of Africa's material cultural heritage remains in overseas exile. The looting of artifacts was a key plank in European colonizers' strategy to subjugate the continent. Now, some of these stolen treasures are beginning to come home, but is it too little too late? 
CGTN Africa's Daniel Plaka breaks it down for us. Last month, authorities in southern Nigeria's Edo state revealed news that many thought would never come. The region's precious Benin bronzes, royal sculptures looted by British colonial troops more than 120 years ago, were finally coming home. The brass, ivory, and golden artifacts were plundered in a punitive campaign waged against the rulers of the highly advanced Benin Empire, whose metallurgy traditions stretched back centuries and produced artifacts far more intricate than what was produced by Europeans at the time. The decision by the British Museum and others to return these stolen goods has been hailed by many as a step in the right direction. But it's also one that comes with some disappointing stipulations. For one, it requires Nigeria to construct a multi-story museum to house the artifacts. On top of that, many of the relics will only be in Nigeria on a rotating loan. It's a bittersweet return for objects that have spent over a century in exile, and many in the country are rightly insulted by the suggestion that their custody over art pieces crafted by their own ancestors' hands should be in any way conditional or temporary. But the colonial theft of art and artifacts is not a problem limited to Nigeria alone. Senegalese researchers found in 2018 that over 80 percent of Africa's material cultural heritage is displayed in museums outside of the continent. These objects weren't simply dug up and excavated by so-called explorers, but often systematically looted by colonial armies in a concerted attempt to hack at the cultural roots of the African civilizations they hoped to dominate. They weren't carried off just as trophies of conquest or for simple profit, but in an effort to erase any evidence of a cultural legacy that might challenge the myth of European supremacy. It's a pattern that has also played out elsewhere in the world. In the same decade that British colonizers burned and pillaged the great city of Benin, or that German imperialists robbed Namibian resistance leader Hendrik Witboy of his ceremonial cattle whip, soldiers from those very same armies were looting their way across Beijing. The so-called Eight Nation Alliance of Imperialist Powers sacked the Chinese capital's famous palaces and temples, setting fire to hundreds of historic buildings and plundering countless relics and artifacts. Since liberation in 1949, China's government has made the return of these treasures a diplomatic priority. And in recent years, there are signs that African countries are beginning to do the same. European stakeholders will often say that they agree in principle to the return of looted art, but are simply concerned whether the pieces can be sufficiently cared for by the African countries that produce them. Not only is this line of reasoning patronizing and condescending, it's also one that has recently lost a great deal of credibility. Last year, an investigation by the German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung found that many of the looted African treasures set to be displayed in a German museum were held for years in deplorable conditions, including flooded storerooms and exposure to toxic dust. If anything, it's another sign that diplomatic muscle can and should be leveraged to ensure that these centuries-old wrongs are urgently righted. If China's own experience is anything to go by, such an insistence on reclaiming ownership over a civilization's cultural products can be an important prerequisite for helping pave the way to dignify post-colonial relations, something that should happen sooner rather than later. I'm Daniel Plafker in Nairobi for CGTN. Catch you next time. Coming up in sports. Johnson Logie looking to put South Sudan on the sporting map at the upcoming Tokyo Olympics. How would you